Thank you very much for coming out this morning um, for, um, for this talk. And um, I already heard that um, you know, some of you might have some kind of you know, professional interest as well in this, in this particular topic, um, maybe in the, in the apparel sector. So you know, I'm happy to um, deliver this as a talk, but um, also to have it a bit more interactive. That's what I like to do in my classes in general. So if you have questions or comments in between, I would like to invite you to just um, you know, um, raise your hand, and then um, we, can, we can open this up while the talk is going on. Um, so I, um, in, this, uh, in this talk this morning, I really want to share uh, my research that I've done over the past five years. So it's been quite an you know, ex extensive journey for myself as well. Um, I've done research on um, global supply chains in, um, in various contexts, but for me the work in Bangladesh has really been eye-opening. And so you know, it's really something that's very close to my heart and I'm really excited to share some of these insights with you today. Um, so what has happened five years after, after Rana Plaza? So almost to, um, you know, to, to the day five years ago, on the 24th of April, 2013, the, um, the Rana Plaza factory in, um, in Bangladesh collapsed. Um, and over a thousand people died. It was one of the worst industrial accidents that, um, that, that we've ever had. However, this was not just one incident, that was part of a series of incidents that, that were happening um, in Bangladesh um, in particular. So it kind of highlighted the general conditions of, of the industry, which were inherently unsafe. Um, and um, what this building collapse also highlighted was that on the day before the building collapsed, there were large cracks that were already appearing um, on some of the walls. Some engineers came in, um, suggested it was unsafe for workers to go in and work. There were, it was a shared building. There were several factories. There was a supermarket. Um, there were a number of other uh, shops. A bank um, was in part of the building. Most of the workers that worked for the supermarket and the bank were told not to come in the next morning. <coughs> However, the garment workers, they were told to come in. So the management of the garment factories they failed to um, safeguard their workers and um, make sure they don't come to work the next day because they had to fulfill the orders for, for Western brands. Um, I think what else, um, the, uh, and, and what this highlights is really the lack of workers' voice in, um, in a country like Bangladesh and in an in industry um, like ready-made garments. Um, so if workers have had a voice to um, refuse unsafe work, probably this disaster could have been prevented. Um, something else that this disaster established, I think, um, and sorry for showing these horrible pictures, um, but it's very much the link that we have as consumers um, and the workers that produce our clothes. So when the accident happened, there were many, you know, many household labels that some of which I have in my cupboard, maybe some of you, you know, you might have them in your cupboard. Um, Mango and Zara and Primark and um, um, Joe Fresh and Benetton. Um, and many of these companies, initially they said, well, we didn't, we had no idea we were producing in, in Bangladesh. We had no idea. Um, we didn't put the order in this factory. Nevertheless, their labels were found, so, so they could not refuse the responsibility. But it kind of highlights a system of subcontracting, fragmentation of relationships and supply chains that then makes it very hard for, uh, for companies to know where their produce is actually being produced. Um, so I think if we just go back and kind of <laughs> look at what are some of the reasons that we um, you know, see such an unsafe model for global production. Um, it's, we can ask ourselves whether the supply chain is um, inherently broken. Um, so the business model is very much based on, on outsourcing. So for me, um, or when, when I did research in Bangladesh, um, the response I always get, well, if there was any ma money made to be a factory owner, probably the brands would do it themselves. They would run their own factories. But most of that is outsourced to factories in Bangladesh. Um, and um, there's been an ongoing price squeeze. 
um, to pay lower and lower um, prices for, um, for the products. Um, and also shorter lead times, you know, fast fashion, more and more fashion cycles, um, the, the drive to get products as soon to the customers as possible. Um, and that really translates into downward pressure on suppliers and on workers. So Bangladesh has the, has the lowest minimum wage, um, or one of the lowest minimum wages. It's um, set at $68. Um, nevertheless, Bangladesh is a very expensive or relatively expensive country to live. Um, and so most workers they actually rely on doing overtime to earn a living wage. So on this, on this wage, they could not survive. So they're now um, talks in process to raise the living wage uh, or to, to raise the minimum wage. Um, but this, this um, hasn't happened. Another, um, another uh, effect of the downward pressure, poor working conditions, um, anti-union practices. Um, so um, I will get to this in a minute, but um, the traditional way of how workers can raise a voice through collective organization um, is very much suppressed in, in, in Bangladesh. So, um, and collectively there's been a lack of investment in building safety. The way the industry has evolved from the 70s was very much um, small entrepreneurs um, opening up a line of garment production, maybe in the living room, maybe then they expand. So what we get is many shared buildings that weren't meant to be garment factories, which now house multiple factories. And like in the building of Rana Plaza, um, there were several stories were added up to the building without any building permission um, being given. So it's kind of a bit of a wild west of, uh, um, of production. Um, and um, so the traditional safeguards that are in place um, have really been undermined by uh, economic globalization. Um, and um, so we really see kind of, um, kind of really this downward pressure resulting in tragedies like Rana Plaza. Um, at the same time, we kind of see, you know, when we look at, at companies and their corporate social responsibility commitments, um, more and more actually uh, promise to have, have a code of conduct. Nike was the very first one in the, uh, in the early 90s to have a code of conduct. So there are more and more commitments being made. Um, but um, the paradox maybe of CSR is that while we have more commitments um, being made, yet conditions are actually getting worse. So there are studies that suggest that labor rights have actually been eroded more than safeguarded despite um, these promises being put in place. I don't know, does anyone of, of you work in the, in the garment industry? Or in, in any related area? Manufacturing. Manufacturing, okay. Okay, yeah. So also global supply chains. Yeah, so some of these kind of issues will be familiar to you. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think if, especially if, um, you know, you purchase uh, from far away places, I think there's always uh, um, some, some problems. I'm not suggesting that <laughs> in this particular case. Um, so um, I want to look at some of the, these CSR commitments, um, what they are and why they might have failed in the past and why they might have failed to prevent tragedies like, um, like Rana Plaza. So are you familiar with codes of conduct? And um, so these are kind of commitments companies make to, um, uh, to, to, um, to safeguard labor rights, but also a number of other conditions in their supply chains. Um, and typically, they're, they're voluntary CSR programs. Um, and they're audited by social auditors who then, for instance, go into a factory and know the code of conduct and then check against this particular code of conduct. Um, however, um, this has not achieved to prevent disasters like Rana Plaza. So for instance, um, two of the factories in Rana Plaza were audited against um, a social accountability standard just a few weeks before the tragedy collapsed. 
Um, so this really, first of all, you know, questions the, um, you know, the, um, the responsibility and accountability of these auditors. Um, but it's very hard to establish because many of them were not experts in structural building safety or in they were not like fire or electrical engineers. Um, nevertheless, um, some studies suggest that they cost companies up to 80% of the ethical sourcing budget. So it's very, very costly to conduct these audits and to keep up the system with individual audits. Um, yet what happens at, on the ground is that um, say I'm a, I'm a factory owner and I probably sell to 10 different brands. So my production facilities is going to be shared. Now each of the different brands will ask me to adhere to their code of conduct and they will send their own auditors. So factory owners and factory owners have to pay for the audits to be conducted. So there's also a conflict of interest going on where factories pay um, the auditors for them to get audited. Um, so that means if I go to factory owners in Bangladesh, they tell me, you know, I have like a social audit taking place every week. It takes up so much of my, you know, of my time, of my workers' time. It's, um, it's, 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 it's very disruptive. Um, and so there's like audit fatigue due to duplication. Um, I was just last week in The Hague at a, at a conference on exactly this, um, on exactly this topic and um, the president of the Bangladesh um, Garment and Export Association um, was there and he was again talking about this model of social auditing and how um, um, this was a waste of time and money to have again and again these audits. Um, but they failed to, un to actually identify and to address the underlying root causes. So they might identify, yes, over time um, work is going on, um, maybe things are unsafe, but often it's, uh, th there's, there's no system to then actually follow up and uh, find out how these non-compliances can be addressed. Um, and on the brand side, it's a similar story that often brands do not follow up on these non-compliances. Um, it's very disruptive, <laughs> right? If you have a supply chain and um, you, know, you operate a fast fashion model um, and um, you hear, hear that one of your suppliers, there might be an issue, it might be very disruptive um, to then stop purchasing from that one and look for a new supplier who can you know, deliver to the same quality, similar cost, and so on. Um, just two weeks, um, no, um, six months before Rana Plaza happened, there was another factory fire at um, the Tizreen Fashion Factory where over 100 people died um, because there was a fire and the fire exits were locked. So people were locked into the building and they couldn't get out. Um, and um, I talked to one of, the, one of the international brands, a UK brand actually, um, and they had conducted a social audit to decide whether or not they wanted to purchase from this particular factory. And they said, well, you know, we realized this wasn't a well-run factory, it would be really unsafe, and we decided not to place our orders there. Many other international brands who would have had access to the same uh, information decided to continue their orders from that factory. Um, and a few weeks later, um, the Tessarine fire happened. Um, so it's also the response, the failed responsibility of brands to act upon the information that, that they may receive. Um, and um, finally, even if one brand can act and suggest not to source, like in the case of the Tesserine factory, because there's so many other brands that are buying, um, the production can still go on. And there's very little incentive for the factory to... Um, to improve and invest in fire safety because there are many other buyers around. So together, all these conditions, they really explain why despite these social codes of conduct and the CSR commitments of companies, we haven't seen much improvement um, and disasters like Rana Plaza that happened. And and I think it really demonstrates the failure of individual action, companies each individual, individually trying to address these issues. Um, so I want to kind of, you know, rethink this scenario and use some kind of, you know, um, intellectual resources and think about worker safety as a collective action dilemma. 
um, and how this might help us to think about the underlying problem um, and how it can be addressed and how it was addressed in this case. So you might be familiar with um, you know, collective action dilemmas, describe a situation where the action of individuals um, leads to lack of investment or resources being overexploited. So, you know, the typical example of, um, you know, the, the, what's often called the tragedy of the commons. You know, you have a commons and each, each farmer has an individual incentive to put one more, um, one more sheep um, to graze. But collectively, the resource, the common resource gets overexploited. Um, and, um, and collectively, everyone suffers from this. Um, so, Hardin suggested freedom in a commons brings ruin to all. Um, which then raises the question of um, what are the institutional design principles that can avoid such a tragedy from happening. Um, so let's look how we can apply this thinking about collective action dilemmas to the case of, um, to the case of Rana Plaza and the situation of Bangladesh and worker safety um, more generally. So... Um, if we first we look at the traditional employment relations actors um, at the host country level in Bangladesh, so the employers, the workers, the government, um, who we would usually expect to um, regulate labor standards and conditions. Um, so in public regulation in, in Bangladesh um, is complicated by the fact that Bangladesh is very much a competition state, um, which is a concept that suggests that Bangladesh competes for inward investment and for um, orders being placed with lots of other low-wage countries, um, such as Vietnam, now Cambodia and Cambodia are becoming destinations for sourcing. Um, Africa is becoming another destination for sourcing. So there's a, you know, there's, um, a fear by the government that if they raise labor standards, and wages um, that companies will just move their production elsewhere to any of the other countries that um, offer um, very similar um, prices, conditions, and so on. Um, also, ready-made garment accounts for over 80%, 82% of exports. Can you imagine? This is just, uh, can you imagine how important this industry is? For one single country, 82% oh, of exports are ready-made garments. And if you think about this, together with the competition state, how um, the risk of companies leaving because um, the costs increase um, is very, very strong. Um, and this re results in, um, as in many of these contexts, the labor law is there, the building co code is there. Um, actually, much of the labor law was... Uh, um, adapted from UK law, um, and however, it's not being implemented. The labor law is actually very good in many um, instances, but it's not being impl implemented. Um, there are not many labor inspectors who can do this job, and the government doesn't invest into this. Um, in fact, the, um, when Rana Plaza happened, I went to um, a conference that took place in Bangladesh, in Dhaka, um, and the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina was speaking and she was, um, um, she was calling Rana Plaza and the international response as an international conspiracy to reduce the competitiveness of the country. So this is kind of the, I just use this as an example to illustrate you the level of um, fear that the government has that raising the standard might actually um, result in, um, in companies leaving the country. Um, on the side of employers, which are the suppliers of, um, of the ready-made garment, um, very low barriers to entry. Um, the Bangladesh specializes in um, cheap T-shirts, um, cheap garments. So it's not so difficult to just open another um, you know, garment factory, very small one maybe, start with subcontracting, um, and then graduate. And so there's really cutthroat competition on a very, very low cost basis. So an individual factory doesn't have incentive to actually upgrade um, in, and invest in worker safety. On the side of the workers, um, 
80% of them are female workers. Many come from the countryside. Many workers are illiterate. Um, and they're also deliberately used in this industry because um, they're more pliable. Um, and they ha they're more happy to work a lot long hours without complaining, without maybe forming a union. Um, and um, they have very low structural power in the supply chain because um, Bangladesh is a country of um, over 160, 170 million people. Many of them are young people. Um, Dhaka attracts over half a million people each year from the countryside who move to the capital looking for work. So there's really a lot of supply of unskilled labor um, that is ready to replace um, laborers in, in the factories. Um, and also very low associational power. Um, yeah, let's. Yes, please. That's great. So, so just quickly, on the competition skills piece, mm -hmm. if it is that the brands insist on the same standards in all countries, then the issue of raising costs by having to have better labor laws, mm -hmm. is it not negated by the fact that they all have to do it? Um, that would be the ideal case scenario. Yeah. 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 But that's exactly what's... what's um, the tragedy of the commons is that that would be so much better. And actually, if you talk to um, you know, managers in companies, they tell you, you know, I wish um, everybody, you know, we just had a common standard and everybody would adhere to that, and then it would be taken out of competition. Um, and something similar happened in response to Rana Plaza, um, that at least all the brands started to collaborate. So I'll get to this in a minute. But at an international level, um, I hope we see that in the future, but it hasn't really, it hasn't really happened yet. Mm -hmm. Any other questions so far? Just a, a question on the mm -hmm. risk appetite. You haven't mentioned risk appetite, which I would have thought is quite a significant issue, both for the cor corporates in the West mm -hmm. and for the local companies. I mean, the, the risk appetite in the local companies, profit is at the head of that, health and safety, which would be actually top of the list here, mm -hmm. and compliance would be at the top of the list is obviously a long way down. And for the brands, I guess the risk appetite, normally around brand damage, uh, they would have a very low risk appetite. Mm -hmm. But um, the death of 100 people appears not to damage a brand. So therefore, it doesn't seem to matter. A 1,000 people, apparently it does matter. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting looking at the reaction of those brands in, in the sense of um, just how many people die in the local area yeah. for it to have an impact. Tens, hundred as you said, in the fire, didn't make any difference. Yeah. Um, a, a thousand suddenly got noticed because of the media attention. And, yeah. you know, Benetton and Primark had to react. Could you say something about risk appetite? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, I would generally say that um, from my own experience in Bangladesh, there's a very high risk appetite, but there's no, not very much a concept of, um, of safety. Um, so you see that in all sorts of industries. I mean, um, I just show you a picture um, later on of uh, of the traffic. Um, so this is kind of the the the, the, the traffic in Bangladesh. So um, you know you see all sorts of um, vehicles, from rickshaws to tuk-tuks to big buses to trucks to pedestrian, all walking around. If you see a construction site generally. I mean, they're building very, very high kind of um, high-rise buildings. There's no kind of, you see kind of workers pulling big bags and you just think, oh my God, if they fall over, they, you know, they will just topple over. So there's kind of a very different conception of what safety means than from what we have. So I would say, yes, in that sense, you can call it risk appetite. In terms of the brands, I mean, I would say, um, um, I think after Rana Plaza has, has radically reduced their risk appetite, um, before, I think there was a feeling that um, um, that they could get away with it, in a sense. Because you said 100 workers, yes. I mean, there were many efforts that were put in place because it was, it was Tazreen. It was um, Spectrum just a few years before. So there were a number of these kind of accidents that did happen and that suggested a pattern. Um, but it wasn't enough to, to really you know, trigger concerted action. Um, and address this. Um, but I think, I mean, I would argue that maybe the social codes of conduct are actually to reduce 
the risk that companies are take and they say, oh, we had this code of conduct, we had auditors and so on. Um, but I think this disaster has really demonstrated that you know, this, this was not really working. Yeah, let's. Um, has your research been able to identify any way of quantifying the risk or the cost of these breaches of regulatory standards in these factories? Um, I mean, it's, it's hard to quant quantify the, the cost of life. I, no, no, I suppose, I no. The, I, what I'm saying is, is that have, have you managed to find any ways to sort of put a number on what the, what the risk means to the business <laughs> and the suppliers mm. of not complying with the regulation that's in place? I mean, I assume going out of business is fairly costly. Yeah. Small, but are there, have there been, are there some ways to measure and monitor what the outcomes are where you can put a sort of comparative number on? the cost of doing business in a, in a you know, rep a compliance mm. factory as opposed to a non-compliant factory, which then causes all sorts of... Mm. Yeah, I mean, I would say this is also the way that costs are put in place, because um, if you were non-compliant and nothing much is happening, you don't have a big disaster from happening, then, you know, your kind of costs are, are zero. You might be non-compliant, but you still have your orders and so on. Um, um, but, 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 but you run the risk that um, a disaster might happen. So, but but I, um, I personally, I haven't done this type of um, quantitative research on um, quantifying this. Um, but I would say um, that the risk of not being compliant is a loss of business, which often is not followed up, but with what happens after Rana Plaza has actually become a, a risk and a real cost that makes a difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name's Joanna. I study business here at Thames. Uh, the gentleman's question before I just sparked a question mm -hmm. in my mind. Um, you mentioned, you, you basically made this this parallel between Western countries and the supplier countries, let's call them Southeast Asia. Um, I'm wondering, of course it makes sense to, to have this kind of structural um, the structure in place where, okay, uh, the suppliers, the companies requesting orders, mm. geographical regions, economies, all of that makes sense when we're doing our analysis. However, when we then move on to implementing a solution, I'm wondering if that kind of dichotomy helps. Uh, I don't know if there's a right answer, but, but I think maybe asking the question is important in the sense that if we, if we constantly make this difference, right, between the uh, advanced Western countries and the less advanced um, Eastern mm -hmm. countries, does it help? Because then it's a sort of hierarchy, isn't it? And I'm wondering, maybe maybe one effect of this kind of difference is um, is, is exactly the fact that a country like Bangladesh, I mean, you mentioned the prime minister, right? The thinking about some sort of mm -hmm. conspiracy. It's, I feel like maybe this is an effect of, oh, we need to, we need to follow the lead of the advanced countries, um, whereas perhaps a more let's call it egalitarian um, solution might perhaps spark entrepreneurship in Southeastern Asia. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering maybe would that be a possible solution to, to basically to reduce the uh, reliance. Do you know what I mean? The reliance on, on Western orders. What do you think about that? Yeah. Um, I, um, I, I, I agree and I think there, there are some um, efforts in place to strengthen some other industries. But if you have 82% of your exports are actually based on garments and on foreign orders, it's very hard to move away, especially if you're, um, Bangladesh is just graduating from a least developed country to lower middle income country. Um, but maybe I'll tell you what happened actually in response to Rana Plaza, so you can see what the solution is that has been, in, has been put in place and how this differs from what has been there before. And maybe we can then see what we think about that, um, that as a solution. Um, so this is just another picture that I wanted to show you as part of um, the research I've been conducted. That was just outside the hotel in, um, uh, in the diplomatic area in Dhaka, in Gulshan. Um, and I just thought it was kind of symbolic because you kind of 
you mentioned about risk and risk appetite. You kind of can see how you know cables are lying around. There's just someone riding on a rickshaw, transporting kind of long pieces. So you know this is just a daily reality. So the kind of idea of you know safety and so on is, is, is not so much in place in um, in Bangladesh. So actually, you know, ensuring worker safety also requires a huge cultural change. Um, so. Collective responses to Rana Plaza that have emerged. Um, right after Rana Plaza, um, Rana Plaza happened, and there was already a meeting to be convened in Germany, in Eschborn, under the um, um, invitation of the, um, the, um, the GIZ, the German Development Agency. Um, and all the different actors actually wanted to talk about Tazreen and Spectrum and the series of disasters that had happened. Um, and then Rana Plaza happened. And suddenly, this meeting became the place where um, they had to negotiate what should be the collective response to Rana Plaza. Um, and um, the tr trade unions, global union federations, Industrial and, Glo and, global, uh, and Uniglobal, they had already worked with some social movement organizations, campaign group, clean clothes campaign, um, um, uh, workers' rights consortium to develop an alternative solution. Um, and they presented this and said, this is going to be the solution. Um, and this is going to be different from social auditing. Um, are you going to sign this? This is going to be the response. Um, and this is a five-year agreement that subsequently has been signed by over 200 Western brands. Um, the two global union federations, the four witness signatories, the NGOs, campaign groups, um, and it's chaired by the International Labour Organization. Um, and it puts credible commitments in place. It commits companies to maintain their purchasing volumes for two years. Um, and it's legally enforceable in the home country of the signatory company. So for the very first time, this is absolutely unprecedented that there's been a legally um, enforceable agreement um, that... Um, the, to maintain purchasing volumes was a commitment to Bangladesh. Um, does anybody have any idea what the, you know, what the export volume might be of garments? Uh, let, let me ask, probably this is, uh, this is um, too much. Who thinks that after Rana Plaza um, exports have increased from, from the country? Okay, yeah? Anybody think they have decreased? Okay, um, they have increased actually. They have increased after after Rana Plaza. Anybody wants to give a wild guess by how much they have increased um, in percentage since Rana Plaza happened? Okay, any higher? Two hundred. Okay, that's optimistic. <laughs> Actually, um, when Rana Plaza happened, um, the exporting volume was about um, 20 billion US dollars, and it's just about to reach 30 billion in five years. But it was actually a commitment that companies made and said, we're not going to go because, you know, uh, we're not going to go to Cambodia or other countries. We commit to Bangladesh as a sourcing destination. Um, we're going to invest in this country, and um, we're here to stay. So that was a very, very important part of this agreement, not just to hit and um, run. It's, it's a bilateral agreement in the sense that it's between the global union federations and the companies. So it's a, it's a negotiated collective agreement. And that's why um, I call it a tr an industrial, trans um, industrial democracy model, because the worker representatives are actually part of the agreement. agreement. Um, and they are part of the governing body of the accord. Um, and so it kind of moves away from um, the, um, the companies being the ones who unilaterally kind of um, come up with standards and conditions. But you have kind of the representatives of the workers who are, who are part of this. For all of this that's going on in the background, to what extent do consumers really care? That's a, that, that, that's a really good question. I mean, you see the, the Volkswagen scandal, and have you seen the latest uh, sales figures of Volkswagen? Um, and I think that's, um, um, that's 
one of the elephants in the room. To what extent does the individual consumer care? Um, I think here it's kind of the importance of having these groups like the Clean Clothes Campaign and the Workers' Rights Consortium who are kind of campaigning groups who kind of assume the voice of the consumer. Even if no individual consumer actually goes into the shop and asks about the, the working conditions, it's these kind of companies who put a lot of pressure. Um, let me give you one example that, um, that occurred to, um, to get companies to sign the accord. Because it was a big question, who's going to be the first to sign? And then everybody would topple like dominoes. Um, so do you know avas.org, the online campaign? Group. So they send kind of emails, and then they ask you to sign, to sign at your name, and so on. Um, and they were running a huge campaign against H&M. H&M is the biggest buyer from Bangladesh. Um, and they were, and together with the Clean Clothes campaign, they were planning to have um, a whole kind of media campaign in Stockholm, um, shaming H&M. And the day before this was rolled out. Um, H&M actually signed the accord. Um, and once H&M signed, then Inditex, which is the biggest um, textile company, then also signed. And once Inditex and H&M had signed, everybody else kind of signed and um, agreed to, to this commitment. Sorry. Why, mm -hmm. why is that? Why do smaller companies need that sort of example to do it themselves? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I think in this case, it's very much because it's going to be costly to enforce the agreement. So um, the Bangladesh Accord agrees to um, put in place collective audits of structural fire and um, um, structural fire and electrical safety, um, and to to go into the factories and have a very in-depth assessment and also a follow-up to see whether remediation is taking place. Um, and I think some of the smaller companies, um, they probably not don't feel confident enough that they can make this investment so that it would make a difference. But why not versus another case could be that, okay, I'm just going to let the big companies with lots of money do it themselves because they can afford it. Me, a smaller company, I'll just go on doing my unethical business. Why, why do you think that doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. um, I think because of the pressure, the public pressure that companies were under. And I think that's maybe um, people said Rana Plaza created a pressure cooker where um, it became really, really difficult to um, disavow your responsibility. Um, and I think that's why over 200 Western brands signed the accord. Um, often it's also supply, supplies of suppliers. So for instance, um, Aldi and Lidl, the, the discounters, they kind of um, suggested to a lot of their suppliers that they please go and sign the accord. So um, I think there were also some smaller companies who were really, really active. Um, but they really wanted to have the assurance that the bigger ones are also behind and also doing their share. Because otherwise, it's kind of on the shoulders of the small companies. Um, we're already talking about a collective action dilemma where free riding is, is the problem. So I think it was very important to know the big ones on board. Who's, who's the social audit conducted on? Is it the Western firm or is it the factory? It's the factory. So yeah. um, does it give, my question was, does it give a sort of the same level of assurance as, say, a financial audit? And was this audit sort of, the audit of that factory, was it, did it fail? Or what was the... The Rana Plaza factory? Yeah. Um, so there were several factories inside the Rana Plaza building. Again, that's why it's so complicated as, as, as a model. Um, and um, two of the factories actually, um, I mean, failure is, it's, it's not so black and white. The social audit says, okay, here there were like maybe 100 criteria and there were non-compliances on 20. Um, and then it's up to, the, to maybe each brand to decide what, what means failure for them. Um, but it's of, it's, it, there's a huge question about the legal liability of, um, of audit firms and um, what it actually means to conduct an audit. But it's, it's not regulated. It's a voluntary. So financial auditing is much more regulated. So there are some legal implications, which that would be done by something like TÜV Rheinland. Um, so they kind of uh, give certificates. Um, they also do a lot of technical auditing. 
Um, but it's a private company, basically, that, that would be hired to conduct, conduct the audit. Yeah. Who pays for it? Is it the factory? The factory pays for it, yeah. That's why there's a conflict of interest, yeah. that the factory pays for, for being audited um, um, itself. Yeah, and so the, the Bangladesh Accord has actually put in place um, an organization with uh, over 100 people in Bangladesh. Um, and they're mainly local auditors, or the local engineers. They've hired local engineers. And part of the plan was also to build capacity in Bangladesh, because it's a five-year agreement. It's just been extended um, for another two to three years. They really want to, um, to make sure the government is capable to take over the, um, um, the, um, the audits and the safeguarding of the safety. Um, and um, I just show you kind of some of the success rates. Um, OK, this is just you know, to give you an idea of um, what has actually been changed. So for instance, before, lots of the fires were due to poor electrical safety. So here's kind of a circuit board um, before and after. Um, the round that has happened um, that, was, that was flagged up and safety inspections. Um, here are um, fire exit staircases being added to buildings that were already there, um, fire doors being fitted. So this was the level of um, kind of remediation that was going on. Um, and this is kind of the progress on, on remediation efforts. So initially, two years, two years in, it was still very low, about 31%. Um, and there was a big question, how do we actually get factories to, to remediate? Um, how do we actually get them to, to speed up this process to actually make workers safe? And over time, now the accord is about at 84% of remediation, which within five years' time is actually an incredible success, I would argue, um, and has, um, of course, there's still some way to go, and that's why the accord has just been extended, but there's really a question, okay, how do we build this capacity for the government, ultimately, in the industry itself to take over this work and make sure you know, all this progress that has been achieved um, won't, uh, you know, won't um, go away. Um, I just want to share with you one of the main factors why I think this model has been so successful. And that's because we talked about the collective action dilemma. And now imagine you have 200 companies who have joined up. Um, that means if you're a factory and you're found to be unsafe, you don't only lose mis you know, your orders from one company, but from 200. So basically, there's now a very, very big incentive for each individual factory to act upon the non-compliances. And also, there's kind of collective oversight um, of the company. So if, if you agree to sign and a factory is found to be unsafe, you commit to stop your sourcing relation. And so I would argue that the industry coming together collectively has really made this change possible. Yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>